Thank you very much for joining us in today's webinar, Lateral and Vertical Saltwater Intrusion into a Coastal Aquifer, Impacts of Sea Level Rise, Storm Surges, Coastal Flooding, and Tides. The webinar today is a presentation of research that's been uh, completed at the at Dalhousie University's Coastal Hydrology Lab by Nicole LaRue, who's on the line with us right now. Um, this research does use hydrogeosphere and uh, some of the more advanced capabilities of hydrogeosphere, including density dependent flow uh, to model the impact of, of climate change on uh, coastal aquifers. Before we get things going and I hand the mic over to Nicole, I'd like to make just a few short land acknowledgements. Um, for those of you who are calling in from outside of Canada, well, you may not be aware, but Canada has a, a difficult sort of colonial history with the First Nations and Indigenous peoples of this land. And as a nation, we're embarking on a journey of truth and reconciliation and performing land acknowledgements is just one small part um, that we can play in that in that journey. So Aquanti uh, is a software research and development company. We're based in Waterloo, Ontario, which is situated in the Haldeman Tract, which is a piece of land that spans six miles on either side of the Grand River from its headwaters down to its um, its outlet in, into Lake Erie. This land was granted to the Haudenosaunee peoples or the Six Nations of the Grand River um, as basically compensation or as uh, as recognition by the British for their the part that they played in the American War for Independence. So this is the traditional territory of the neutral or Attawandaran, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's people. Uh, at Aquanti, we just want to acknowledge that we are privileged and very happy to be able to live, work uh, on this land. The research um, that is being presented today is was performed in Nova Scotia. So Dalhousie University is located in Jibokduk, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, the research that is being presented today took place specifically in the, the Annapolis Valley region on the north coast, north coast of Nova Scotia. This is also part of the ancestral and unceded territory of the Miga, sorry, Mi'kmaq people and is home today to the Annapolis Valley First Nation. Um, so again, on, on behalf of the researchers, we're just grateful to be able to live, work and learn on this territory and recognize that as treaty people, we all have a responsibility to respect and uphold the inherent treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across Canada. Um, so with that land acknowledgement uh, completed, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll pass things over to Nicole to begin our presentation. Thank you, Nicole. Um, thanks, Braden, and um, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'm excited to talk about my master's research um, on lateral and vertical saltwater intrusion into a coastal aquifer and really looking at the impacts of sea level rise, storm surges, coastal flooding, and tides. So I wanted to start off um, sort of talking more broadly um, about coastal Canada's groundwater resources. Um, so groundwater is a really critical resource for many Canadians um, and Maritimers or Atlantic Canadi Canadians use more groundwater um, per capita. Um, so on this map here, you can see PEI relies entirely on groundwater. Um, New Brunswick about two thirds and Nova Scotia about um, 50%. And this is extensively used for both um, drinking water and irrigation resources. Um, but groundwater resources aren't always at the front or the forefront of um, decision making as they're out of sight and therefore often um, out of mind. And this is sort of important to think about moving forward into the future um, when we think about the impacts of climate change on this coastal region. And the Atlantic coast has the highest projected sea level change in Canada as noticed, noted here on the map in red. Um, and this coincides with the area that also uses the most groundwater resources. And these resources are vulnerable to um, climate change impacts like sea level rise and intensifying storms because any perturbation in the surface domain directly impacts the subsurface um, and can essentially squeeze groundwater. Um, and this is sort of known as the coastal groundwater squeeze, which is defined as um, threats to groundwater resources due to poor um, coastal zone management, which is highlighted in this um, figure from Michael et al. in 2017. 
Um, and coastal squeeze can come in different forms, such as um, anthropogenic contamination, which can be a result of um, agricultural or industrial runoff. But the focus of this presentation will be on um, the impacts of saltwater intrusion. And saltwater intrusion is the encroachment of saline water into formerly freshwater zones of coastal aquifers, um, and it occurs over both short or episodic and long term um, time scales. This conceptual model, model here um, just shows a cross section of a typical coastal aquifer um, where saltwater is in uh, the gray color and freshwater is in light blue. Um, and where these two meet in the subsurface often forms what's called a saltwater wedge here. Um, and I've highlighted in this blue box what's called the upper saline plume. Um, and this is primarily driven by um, tidal pumping and variable density. Um, and the upper saline bloom will be really important um, for the remainder of my talk, and I'll bring it up again in a few slides. Um, but in terms of the impacts of climate change on coastal aquifers, if we look at um, panel C here, you can see that um, an increase in sea level in the surface domain essentially drives landward movement of this salt wedge or the upper saline bloom, um, and it can result in upconing or active saltwater intrusion of any coastal um, freshwater wells. Um, and the same goes for surge induced overtopping. So larger um, coastal storms can result in um, vertical salinization and these salt plumes developing, um, which also pose contamination risks to any wells that are close by. Um, and in many coastal areas, um, the dikes were built, which are these coastal structures um, that were uh, essentially put in place to remove tidal influences from the surface domain and develop this really nutrient rich agricultural land and also promote um, coastal community development. And in Nova Scotia, we have over 240 kilometers of dikes that protect over 17,000 um, hectares of land. Um, however, these dikes were built in the 1700s. Um, and are not really adequate to cope with climate change um, moving forward. There's been lots of news articles um, in the last few years talking about how Nova Scotia um, could become an island if these dikes aren't upgraded and how vulnerable these low-lying lands are um, to climate change. However, dike management techniques are complex and multifaceted and there's not really one solution that um, sort of solves all the problems. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, I just highlights um, the three most common um, dike management techniques. The first one being um, sort of topping up or increasing the critical elevation of the dike. However, this does require some land um, to maintain proper slopes. Um, another option is to retreat the dike back. However, this does result in some loss of agricultural land, um, but does re restore some foreshore marsh, which is good for um, attenuating wave energy. And another option is to completely remove or breach the dike, um, which essentially results in complete, complete loss of agricultural land. Um, so there's lots of different pros and cons to these dike management techniques, um, but they're mostly not well understood um, from a groundwater resources perspective. And that's what really motivated um, this study. So I've listed here um, the main objectives of this work, um, the first being to investigate how tides drive coastal aquifer mixing. Um, we also wanted to simulate how sea level rise would influence these dynamics. And we also wanted to simulate how overtopping events could salinize agricultural and freshwater resources under different dike management um, scenarios. And really the ultimate goal was to provide new hydrogeological understanding of groundwater dynamics and dike lens to inform management alternatives. So to do so, we initiated a field campaign near the town of Wolfville, um, which as Braden mentioned, is located in the Annapolis Valley, shown on this map here. And the valley is bordered uh, by the Bay of Bundy, which is home to the highest tides in the world, which makes it a really um, unique study area. Uh, we use several different field monitoring techniques, uh, which are shown on this map here, and some of which included um, wave and tide monitoring. Uh, we did some time domain electromagnetic geophysics, and we also did some groundwater level and electrical conductivity monitoring. 
And really the purpose of the field data collection was to calibrate and validate a numerical model. Um, and we use type of Geosphere, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, it's very comprehensive and complex three-dimensional model. Um, however, due to the um, complexity of what we were trying to simulate with the um, unsaturated zone, salt transport, variable density, and a transient tidal boundary, um, we opted to use a two-dimensional surface subsurface model, uh, which is pictured here in the first panel. And this was a three-layer model, and the boundary conditions we used included um, freshwater recharge, recharge boundary on the land side and a time-varying um, time-varying head boundary on the seaside. And then in the subsurface domain, we specified a freshwater head on the land side and no flow and no solute transport along the bottoms, bottom and seasides. And of course, the dual node approach was used to couple um, processes between the two domains. And then in panel B, um, I show the modeling process that was used um, to ultimately achieve our final goals. So we started with um, a steady state run to quasi equilibrium with just um, salt transport. We then turned the tides on um, and ran it to a dynamic equilibrium. And then finally um, turned variable density on. And these three steps were um, an iterative process and required a lot of adjusting of parameters and rerunning. Um, but ultimately, we broke it up into these three steps to reduce our simulation run times and make the project feasible within um, a master's timeline. So then once we achieved um, our um, equilibrium and satisfactory calibration, we then um, simulated lateral saltwater intrusion by imposing a sea level rise projection for um, 2050 RCP 2.6. And this simulation was run again without the tides um, just to increase decrease our run times. But follow once the final sea level was achieved, we then turned the tides on um, and ran the simulation out. And to assess um, the impacts of vertical saltwater intrusion, we ran three different surge scenarios. Um, so we ran a one meter surge, a two meter surge, and a two meter surge with the dike removed. Um, and these surge events were run for two hours, um, superimposed on high tide. And then following the surge event, um, we returned the boundary to the regular um, mega tidal oscillation. And then following the saltwater intrusion simulations, we ultimately wanted to assess the aquifer um, vulnerability and recovery following these events. And now moving into um, some of our field monitoring results. Um, so this figure just highlights um, a few of the key results that we found through the field campaign. Um, so first of all, this map here shows um, it's just a snapshot of the map I had on the on the earlier slide, but the triangle shows our tidal station and the hexagon shows the freshwater um, monitoring well that we instrumented. And this well is located about 100 meters inland and 70 meters, it extends 70 meters below the ground surface. Um, and if we look at this first panel here, the light blue shows the surface or tidal water level, and then the dark blue shows um, the groundwater level from that monitoring well. And we saw about a 14 meter range in the um, tidal level during spring tides, which is obviously a substantial tidal range. Um, and the Bay of Fundy is home to the highest tides in the world. So it was really cool to capture that. Um, and then even more interestingly, we saw about a meter and a half range in the groundwater level. Um, again, at this 100 meters inland and 70 meters um, below the ground surface. So these results really show pronounced fluctuations in um, groundwater levels and a strong um, connection between land and sea. And then moving into our geophysics results. Um, so we collected sort of time-lapse resistivity data at one location in front of the dike, which is shown uh, with this orange square here. And we took a measurement about every hour um, as shown on this panel D. And then in panel C here, the resistivity results that we got. So within the first 20-ish meters, um, we saw that resistivity really didn't change much um, during the flood tide, indicating the likelihood of a confining layer, which makes sense given the geology. Um, and then at depth, we saw about an order of magnitude change um, just during the flood tide, indicating 
probably the presence of an upper saline plume. So as the tide went up, the electrical conductivity went up. And overall, these field results really highlighted strong ocean aquifer interactions, which was a really critical um, finding for our numerical modeling um, endeavors. Now moving into um, some modeling results, starting with the calibration. So our hydrogeosphere model was calibrated to match the presence of that upper saline plume and lack of salt wedge, which is based on um, electrical conductivity and geophysics surveys, which I just showed. And we also calibrated to match the hydraulic head range and mean head um, in that monitoring well. So this figure here shows our um, calibration results. And the top panel just shows a uh, heat map of hydraulic head. Um, but panel B shows a heat map of the salinity distribution, where blue is freshwater and red is saltwater. And moving forward, um, all of the heat maps that I show will be um, of the salinity distribution. So following calibration, we were able to achieve a really nice, well-defined upper saline plume. And then at the location of the monitoring well, which is noted here with the diamond, you can see that we got a pretty nice match between the simulated and observed hydraulic head. And the reason for the discrepancy is primarily because I imposed um, a perfect sinusoidal boundary in the model, whereas realistically there's many more tidal constituents um, at play. And I just did that to, again, simplify our model a little bit. Okay, moving into our lateral, lateral salt water intrusion results um, from sea level rise. So this figure here on the right shows um, three different snippets in time from these simulations. Um, so just a reminder, the sea level rise simulation, um, as the sea level was increasing, we had the tides turned off because it wouldn't have been possible to run 30 years of simulation with um, the megatidal boundary. And the white line, the white contour line shows um, sort of the outline of the initial condition upper saline plume. So this is one year into the sea level rise simulation, and then panel B shows um, immediately following the sea level rise. So in 2050, you can see the upper saline plume is um, completely gone, which of course makes sense because the tides weren't turned on. And then panel C shows um, one year post sea level rise with the tides reintroduced. Um, so you can see that sea level rise and tides both drove expansion and movement of the upper saline plume. So moving from the initial condition white line to the new, um, new extent of that upper saline plume shown in black. And ultimately, if these simulations were run out longer, we could hopefully achieve um, an equilibrium, but it wasn't feasible within the timeline of this project. However, these results do highlight um, potential contamination risks for any nearby um, coastal pumping wells. Now moving into uh, the vertical saltwater intrusion um, results from these storm surges. So again, we ran three different surges, um, a one meter surge, a two meter surge, and a two meter surge with the dead removed. Um, the first row shows 24 hours after each, each surge event. Um, so you can see the one meter surge did not overtop the dike, but the two meter surge did. And um, obviously there was splitting with, with the dike um, removed. And then the second row shows one year, um, one year following the surge event. And in these black boxes here, I've just um, blown up the shallow agricultural land so that you can see um, the features a little bit more clearly. And I also changed um, the range of the um, heat map here to make the features a little bit more visible. So following the surge events, we ran the simulations out um, with the tides turned on, but also with the tides turned off so that we can try and investigate um, how tides um, play or what, tide, what role the tides play in um, aquifer flushing rates. And so first we'll look at results from the two meter surge with the dike in place. Um, so you can see for the tidal case, um, salt fingers began to develop within um, one year after the surge event and were quite pronounced um, four years after the surge event. Um, but the infiltration rate was not super fast. And for the no tide case, we saw very 
sort of opposite. We saw very uniform infiltration um, throughout the entire simulation period as well. Um, and similarly, for the two meter surge with the dike removed, we saw similar um, similar findings. Uh, salt fingers didn't develop quite as quickly for the um, simulation with the dike removed. This is probably because um, there was a higher concentration of saline water that infiltrated behind the dike, shown here. And we also saw very uniform infiltration um, in the shallow zone without the tide in place. Um, but ultimately, these results show that um, the aquifer was not able to recover to the pre-surge state um, within the simulation runtimes, which indicates that there could be devastating consequences um, for these agricultural crops that rely on freshwater um, to thrive. So what does this mean for dike management? Well, this study has highlighted new considerations for quantifying risks and informing sustainable groundwater and dike management. Um, I've highlighted here on this figure that um, fresh groundwater supply is only one ecosystem service of many. That has to be considered when making these types of decisions. So it's not um, an easy, not an easy decision to make. Um, so there's really many considerations and stakeholders at play. And to conclude, our most critical resource has not been considered in Canadian dikeland systems. Aquifer ocean interactions are highly variable and dynamic due to the mega tidal forcing. Tide driven well fluctuations reveal strong connectivity to the sea, which could be really critical for coastal aquifer protection. Um, climate change perturbations will drive lateral and vertical saltwater intrusion, as we saw with the modeling simulations. And ultimately, dike management solutions should consider um, groundwater resources. And with that, I would just like to um, first and foremost acknowledge Aquanti for the substantial um, numerical modeling support that I received throughout the duration of this project, uh, which really made the work possible. And then also to the funding bodies um, listed here for all of their support. And uh, with that, if we have time, I can take questions, but also I have my email um, listed here if anyone wants to reach out that way. Thank you so much, Nicole. I actually see one hand up, or two hands up. Let's go with Ed first, Ed Siddiqui. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, I'm just curious. Uh, what were the longitudinal and transverse dispersivities you used in the model? Um, so they're shown here in this table. I'm not sure if you can see, but um, for the clay and the sand layers, which were the top two, um, I used two meters for the longitudinal and 0.2 for the transverse. Great. Uh, any follow up on that, Ed? Or uh... no, that uh, they they seem reasonable. Um... The smaller is better, which you have fairly small values. Terrific. Thanks, Ed. Um, I did see briefly uh, another hand up from Yaming Chen. Did you have a question? No, thank you. No, it's great presentation. Thank you. OK. Well, I, I guess, uh, oh, here we go. Another hand from Kevin. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Great, thanks. Um, could you explain a little bit more how you thought the time domain resistivity or um, electromagnetics was giving you information about the upper saline plume? Sure. Um, so the upper saline plume is really driven um, primarily by tidal pumping. Um, and with the confining layer that we knew was present just based on um, geology records. We attributed this substantial change um, to be a result of that upper saline plume in response to the tidal um, flooding. And we also hypothesized that there's not really um, a salt wedge present in this region because of that confining layer. OK, so somehow the the upper saline plume infiltration is going through the confining layer or coming from like farther offshore or something like that? Or how, I, I would think the confining layer would be 
keeping the upper saline plume from reaching the deeper groundwater. So the confining layer, beneath the confining layer, um, we believe is really fractured um, sandstone bedrock that's got a really high hydraulic conductivity, which is why we are seeing um, more infiltration at that depth. OK, thanks. Yeah, it could be that there's something going on with the um, the lateral spatial um, kind of resolution of the time domain EM that as you're seeing deeper, you're also seeing farther to the side. And so it could be some 3D effect that you're also seeing here. But thank you. For sure. We've also used this um, set up at some other sites around Nova Scotia and with smaller tidal ranges, and we haven't seen the same um, sort of magnitude of change. Thank you, Kevin. I have uh, another question here in the chat from Graham. I love this question. What is the best piece of advice you could give to a new grad student starting a similar density dependent flow project? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, looking back, I think that it's probably the most important to make sure that your initial setup is very sound and you're not trying to skip steps and move forward just to get simulations running. Um, I ended up having to redo things quite frequently and then with the long simulation run times, um, it ended up being a really, really complex and long modeling process. Um, so yeah, I would just say like take things very slowly from the beginning and make sure um, everything, everything makes sense before you add a new, new complexity on. Great advice, and I think it echoes actually some advice that we were trying to communicate in an, a webinar earlier this month. And uh, I suppose there will likely be many people watching this recording on YouTube uh, somewhere down the line. So highly encourage those new users to review all of the available Hydrogeosphere webinars. Um, I have one question myself, actually, just a small, I guess, historical context question you you had mentioned uh, or or highlighted a few articles news articles about uh, you know the impacts of climate change on coastal hydrology i was just wondering if there have been many instances already of uh, overtopping of these dikes due to storm surges and uh, whether or not you know there are any ongoing studies to monitor the ongoing impacts uh, of that type of situation for sure um I know that close by to my um, study site during spring tides, there's already a section of the dikes that gets overtopped regularly, so twice a month. Um, but the Minas Basin isn't really um, a wave dominated area. So by the time waves make it into the basin, they're usually quite small. Um, so it's more so about the timing of um, the waves with the tides that puts um, the dike lens at more of a risk. Great. Might have to get some monitoring wells in there. Um, OK, well, I'll just maybe give one more chance if there are any other questions. Going once, going twice, going three times. OK, well, Nicole, um, on behalf of everyone at Quanti and the wider Hydrogeosphere user base, thank you very much for presenting this work. It was really interesting. Um, if there are any other Hydrogeosphere users on the line right now, uh, we're always interested at Aquanti in, you know, spreading um, not the you know best in class knowledge and uh, you know advice on using hydrogeosphere for cutting edge kinds of problems and research. If there's any interest in delivering your own research uh, through a small presentation to the wider Aquanti network, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, if there are any questions just in general about hydrogeosphere and potentially applying it to your own work, feel free to reach out to us at Aquanti. We can be reached uh, through sales at Aquanti.com or info at Aquanti.com. Or you can reach out to me personally. My name is Braden McNeil. I think I'm probably in touch with everyone who's on the line here. My email address is bmcneil with two L's at Aquanti.com. Um, so once more, thank you very much, Nicole. It was a great presentation.